Hello all and uh, welcome. Good morning and to some of you, good afternoon. Um, I see that our participants has remained stable for a while, so I figured it was time to introduce us all and say hello. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. All right. Uh, my name is Carla Viertiller and I work for the National Sexual Violence Resource Center. Um, and I want to introduce you to your presenters today. Uh, we have Kat Fribley and Elizabeth Edmondson Bauer from the Resource Sharing Project. We have Rebecca Moses from JBV Consulting. And then finally, we have Condensia Braid from the National Organization of Sisters of Color Ending Sexual Assault. Uh, and today we're going to talk about sexual assault, housing, and HUD funding, uh, specifically for coalitions, as you know. Um, and But first I want to talk a little bit of, about sort of how our partnership and this sort of work came from. Uh, NSVRC is part of the National Domestic Violence Housing Technical Assistance Center. Um, and this is an organization of uh, funded by four federal funders, not just one. I think it's the only project um, funded across different uh, federal partners. And they created a grant around um, housing and violence and multiple people applied and multiple, multiple people were funded. So now we have a consortium made up of the National Alliance for Safe Housing, Collaborative Solutions Incorporated, the National Network to End Domestic Violence, the National Resource Center on Domestic Violence, Collaborative Supportive Housing, and then finally, uh, NSVRC was a recent addition. And I am gonna stop because I promised our interpreter I would allow her to sort of talk about how that works and I did not do that. So Vanessa, my deep apologies and please um, share a little bit about how to access uh, interpretation. Thank you. Um, okay, so can you hear me? Okay, very well. So I will read a brief announcement. Thank you once again. Uh, so today's event will be conducted in English with live interpretation available into Spanish. To listen to the interpretation on a computer, locate the globe icon along the bottom row of your Zoom screen and select Spanish. If you're joining via the Zoom app on a mobile device, click more on the three dots in the bottom right corner of your screen, select language interpretation, then choose Spanish and click done. If you would like to hear only the interpreters without the original speakers in the background, click mute original audio when selecting your language. And we ask that everybody, English speakers and even um, bilingual folks, please choose a language to ensure clear communication. And you can change your listening language at any time throughout the program. Now I'm going to say the same thing in Spanish. El evento de hoy se llevará a cabo en inglés. Si desea escuchar la interpretación al español en su computadora, haga clic en el icono del globo terráqueo en la parte inferior de la pantalla de Zoom y seleccione español. Si se está uniendo a través de la aplicación Zoom en un dispositivo móvil, seleccione su idioma haciendo clic en More, Más o en los tres puntos en la esquina inferior derecha de la pantalla. Seleccione Language Interpretation, que es interpretación del idioma, luego elija Spanish y haga clic en Done. Listo. Si desea escuchar solo a los intérpretes sin los ponentes originales, haga clic en Mute Original Audio para silenciar el audio original cuando seleccione el idioma. Y se pide que todos, incluso los que hablen inglés y los bilingües, eh, que seleccionen un idioma para permitir una comunicación clara y se puede cambiar de canal de audio para escuchar en otro idioma en cualquier momento del programa. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. Again, my apologies, everyone. Um, sometimes I get a little over enthusiastic, um, but that is no excuse. Um, so I want to continue sort of where we were. So these are our technical assistance partners in the DV TAC housing group. Um, and recent, and there was a point maybe three, four years ago um, where the consortium got together um, and realized that we were, they were funded to do work around sexual violence and housing, but they realized they did not have the expertise to do so. Um, so they got a group of us together in Washington um, who had been doing sexual violence and housing work and just sort of had us talk through some ideas 
about you know how sexual violence in housing works, how different it is from domestic violence in housing and as far as services needed, services provided. Um, and we were we were given an opportunity to present to the federal funders and um, wrote for a grant and received a grant to become part of um, the consortium. Um, and so in that work, we were sure to partner with folks we worked with along the way. Um, so Sisters of Color Ending Sexual Assault, uh, Condensia Braid, and then RSP, Elizabeth and Kat have been strong partners of ours as we're moving through this work. Um, at NSVRC. And I do want to share that um, we were not able to change the name of the TA consortium, but that is something in the works, hopefully, um, for reasons that are probably pretty obvious. Um, so that is exciting. And I also want my other two colleagues here from NSVRC to introduce themselves that are also part of the project. Uh, Jen Benner, will you just give a quick hi? Hi, I'm Jen Benner. I'm the Resource Development Coordinator. Um, and yeah, so I helped plan the meeting today and get everything all set up for everybody. So you might have seen emails from me. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Louis Marvin, Training Specialist at the National Sexual Violence Resource Center. Um, thanks for coming to this. Thanks, Louis and Jen. And then I'm going to show you something you're all very familiar with. <laughs> just so you know. Um, and now we're going to get down to it. So we are going to do two poll questions to start off, um, just to sort of see where we are collectively in terms of housing work. Um, so our first question, have you worked with any housing systems? So that would be uh, communities of care or COCs in your state. Uh, have you worked with any HUD funding or worked with anybody who received HUD funding? Um, any state or local housing funding that you or your program or you assisted programs with in your state? Oh, I thought. Oh, I, this is our first team Zoom webinar. So I apologize. Usually someone hosts. So I did not launch it. It was up, but I did not launch it. So there you go. <laughs> Oh, I see some yeses. Would folks be willing to share either in the chat or by unmuting yourself, uh, what sorts of housing work you've done in your state? Does anybody have any thoughts or anything they're willing to share? Doing it in the chat is fine. Okay. Oh, here we go. We are part of our state housing coalition uh, and worked with programs who receive HUD funding. Oh, that's cool. Um, and my position is HUD funded to coordinate with our rural balance state COC around coordinated entry. Would you all mind uh, sharing which state you're from too when you comment? I should have asked for that before just so we can get an idea. And are either of those sexual assault specific? Or is it dual work or domestic violence work exclusively? Dual, okay. These are the final results. Thank you for your patience as we move through this. We have a second poll. Okay, here we go. Uh, is there anyone in your state doing sexual assault specific housing work, whether it be you or any of your of the programs that you work with. Okay, a lot of I don't know. Two yeses, and dual, which which means sexual assault often gets um, pushed aside, especially in housing work. Yep, yep. Okay, great. Um, 
feel free to add anything by unmuting yourself or sharing in the chat as we move forward. We really want this to be as interactive as possible because as you all know, um, very little is being done around sexual violence and housing. And we also know very little about what is happening with sexual violence and housing. Um, so we've, we've been hearing about little bits and pieces happening across the country, um, but we're hoping that we, uh, we can sort of gather some of those stories and ideas and share them across the country. So people have an idea of how to support um, doing sexual violence and housing work, what that looks like when it's successful, um, and also have people to talk to, to dialogue around, et cetera, et cetera. So we really thank you for your participation. Um, I also wanted to briefly share that uh, as part of our funding, we have been able to create, because as I said earlier, we don't know much. So we, our first order of business um, was to create an annotated bibliography to give us an idea of what research was done around sexual violence and housing, what's out there, um, what we can use for funding uh, grant applications, et cetera, et cetera. Um, then we created a comprehensive resource list uh, related to sexual violence and housing resources uh, and homelessness. And then finally, uh, we were able to create a series of infographics. Um, so I will share those in the chat. We have a whole page on our website dedicated to those resources. There are more in the works. Um, and we will probably continuously over the um, over the period of this webinar be sharing more resources with you. And if something comes up for you where you're looking for something, do not hesitate to, to ask in the chat or reach out to us afterwards. I think another key takeaway we really want to share today is that we are a technical assistance provider. So we may not know the answers, but we have the, the capacity and the funding to work with you as you work through these thoughts, um, plans. Um, so we're here, whatever, whatever you need. And with that, um, I'm going to pass it over to Elizabeth and Kat to talk a little bit about an overview of survivor-centered housing. Thank you. Hi, friends. So my name is Kat Fribley, and I'm with the Resource Sharing Project, and I know lots of you. I'm super excited to see you all on this um, webinar and have a chance to really dig into questions about issues of information around um, sexual assault and housing, really specifically. And um, when Elizabeth and I talked, we thought one of the things that would be really helpful is some context giving, right? Um, and I wanted to just share, you know, we've been having these conversations in some other places with some of you all, as we've done through the resource sharing project, along with Rebecca Moses um, from GBB Consulting, been doing work around transitional housing, really specifically, and working with transitional housing grantees through OBW, who... Um, already are doing this work uh, to help them enhance um, their sexual assault specific work and housing advocacy. So you may have seen us there. We also, of course, are partnering with the uh, folks at um, the National Sexual Violence Resource Center and with Condensia and crew at CSE to like think about even more broadly because transitional housing is but one small part of the housing world, right? And so that's part of how this came about is for many of us who are standalone sexual assault or who have focused on sexual assault, HUD is like a completely mysterious new world um, for us, right? And so we thought it would be really useful to pull together a chance for coalitions um, specifically to you know dig into HUD, dig into um, the resources that are available and to really center ourselves in terms of sexual assault and housing. So one of the things I really love to do is to center us with some sort of grounding truths, right? And I want to share some of our grounding truths with you all. Um, also, having the baby here makes me really happy. Thank you, Hillary, for having a tiny coworker. <laughs> um, so when we are doing this work, I just want to acknowledge all of our work is about centering the needs of sexual violence survivors and that we're talking especially about those who are facing the most sort of structural inequities and systemic racism as being at the core of what we want to be changing and doing and thinking about, right, in terms of housing. And I want to be clear that today and in our work, we're talking specifically about sexual violence outside of the context of domestic violence or intimate partner violence. That is also super important. And we need to be thinking about how we best serve um, survivors of 
domestic violence and um, in other forms of interpersonal violence who are also experiencing sexual assault or sexual violence. But for our time today and for the work that we're doing, it is focused exclusively on the needs of sexual assault survivors, partly because what we heard was when we're talking about essay outside of the context of DV, folks struggle more to incorporate that into their work, their housing work. And so we want to create space for that conversation to come forward and for us to really center and prioritize the needs of sexual assault survivors. So as we do that, I want to just name, like I said, a couple of grounding truths. Um, housing instability and homelessness, we know you all are risk factors for sexual violence, right? Sexual violence is also um, uh, sort of vice versa, um, a risk factor for housing instability and homelessness. It is, it goes both ways, right? So when we talk about survivors needing housing due to sexual violence, we also know that sexual violence sometimes occurs due to a need of housing um, that folks have. So we like to make sure that we're always holding both of those truths as we dig into more of the needs and the barriers and, and what it is that HUD specifically offers. Um, lots, as we know, of children and young adults um, become homeless or have housing instability directly as a result um, of sexual abuse. And we just want to name that. Um, and we also know that often that contributes to housing issues later in life um, as well. And that it's important for us to center that in our conversations about what it is that survivors need in terms of housing advocacy and housing itself from us. We wanted a space to really be able to talk with you all, knowing that you all are often the ones talking with programs, right, in your states and in your territories about how to address this sort of foundational issue. And right now, within the current context of COVID, you all, we know it's an even more visible reality, um, that sort of uh, reality that survivors need housing solutions now more than ever, um, and that as we are looking at who is needing housing, it's not equal across the board, right? We know that folks who face structural inequities, um, folks who face systemic racism, oftentimes are needing different and, and better housing interventions, um, survivors are. So COVID, you all, has elevated this conversation <laughs> about sexual violence and housing to a really different level, partly because it's like, um, COVID has helped us peel back layers um, that were maybe obfuscating um, part of how sexual violence works, which is folks often experience sexual violence within housing structures. That might be a landlord, that might be another tenant, uh, it could be maintenance or other housing employees, right? It could be folks who are roommates um, or others who control housing for folks. And we just want to lift that up as well, because I think oftentimes, um, especially when we use a domestic violence lens, it's really hard to remember that sometimes the sexual violence is not happening in the home from someone else who lives with you and is uh, a part of your family, but it might be happening within a different context within your housing. And COVID really, I think, has helped us to elevate that issue in an unfortunate way, as we have seen um, landlords and folks in housing really prey on, um, on folks who weren't able, for example, to pay rent um, or were needing uh, um, a different form of housing. So all of this really comes down to the fact that survivors deserve safe housing and they need a safe place to heal, friends. And when we're talking about sexual violence in particular, housing advocacy can be a really important and powerful tool to helping folks um, create those spaces of safety, create those spaces of healing, and create those spaces of comfort. And coalitions in particular have a super big role um, to play in this, you all. I also want to say that as we're having conversations that are really crucial around racial justice and around what it looks like to think about how our work happens within criminal legal systems, that housing is another system that we can invest in, if you will, for survivors' healings, even as we're thinking about all of the different systems, right, and how we're interacting with them. Housing can be one of those places that creates opportunities for deep healing um, for survivors of sexual violence. So 
those were my like sort of big grounding kinds of contexts. And what I would love is if, do you all have additional ones that you work from? If you are focusing on sexual assault and housing, are there other sort of framing pieces that you hold center for yourself um, in doing this work and that you really want to make sure to get to share? Because we would love to hear them. Are there ones that you think I missed? <laughs> Help me add to them, friends, if there are. Just because this has come up in different conversations recently, Kat, I think a link to economic justice absolutely in this conversation is essential. Yes. Um, and then um, we are really trying at NSVRC to have more meaningful conversations as housing on housing as prevention work yes. um, with yeah, the programs. Sure. Um, so those are two that I would, I would bring to the. I love that. And I would add, you know, that one of the things certainly that I've seen over the my years of doing this work is that sometimes the folks who are out in front of this, the ones who are really thinking deeply about homelessness, housing instability, and sexual violence are um, queer and trans youth organizations, youth serving organizations. And that's because so many um, queer and trans youth have been experiencing um, homelessness due to um, due to who they are, due to their identities, right? And so part of what I am always hoping for too is to just be learning with and from folks who are already doing this work, which is also part of why I think we wanted to bring all of us together into this conversation to hear how's that happening for you all. Elizabeth, did I miss anything? Okay, no, I don't think so. Um, I was just going to uh, drill down just a little bit yeah. on um, some of the barriers that we see specifically for survivors of sexual violence outside the context of domestic violence. Um, Kat really lifted up some of the specific needs in a, in a big picture way. Um, but what we see is that survivors of sexual violence really need, like Kat said, a safe place to heal. Um, and holistic services that really understand the impact of sexual violence and of trauma across the lifespan. Um, and what we see is that most housing structures, funding, programs, um, folks in positions of power making decisions on access to housing um, don't really set up their programs with that lens, right? Um, they really are set up and targeted um, and built for uh, survivors of domestic violence often fleeing danger. And so um, a huge barrier um, is the bottom line is access, right? Um, we're seeing uh, different programs where like the homelessness definitions don't take into consideration these uh, intersections of homelessness and sexual violence. Um, again, funders and program staff and folks um, in decision-making positions uh, don't understand sexual violence at its core. Um, and that's some of the work that we've been doing uh, with this project and with transitional housing is really educating housing folks around the dynamics of sexual violence and the needs, uh, the real specific needs of um, survivors of sexual violence. Um, and then kind of broadly, again, the lack of understanding of how sexual violence may impact folks across the lifespan. So someone um, may not be fleeing violence, but their housing may be impacted by sexual violence they've experienced across their lifetime. And that's a real uh, shift for folks who are do, doing housing work to really look at how someone, um, how trauma has impacted folks across the lifespan and how it's impacting their housing. Um, again, I wanted to kind of lift up uh, something Kat said about um, folks who may uh, commit harm, sexual violence harm um, are, are aside from intimate partners could be landlords, um, these property managers, it could be your boss, uh, it could be your neighbor, it could be someone uh, living in campus housing with you, um, it could be someone um, at the nursing home where someone lives. So uh, we're looking really across um, where every where people live everywhere, right? Um, and how that's really, again, not the lens of someone um, working in housing traditionally looking at uh, that would be a survivor that they may be able to serve. So um, we're really taking on some 
some barriers here uh, to increase access for survivors of sexual violence. Um, and now I want to really kind of shift gears to talk about um, HUD funding, which is, um, and HUD in general, which is uh, kind of dictates a lot of the housing world. Um, and I think the first thing we wanted to do, Rebecca, is ask folks if you had a chance to uh, listen to the webinar that we did with the HUD folks from the SNAPS office, and if there were specific questions we uh, we want to address, uh, we're kind of here to kind of, as a follow up to that to kind of decode and unpack um, some of that those bigger pieces of HUD. So if you want to chat in or um, unmute yourself to talk about uh, any of those questions, that would be super helpful. Rebecca. Hey everybody, I'm Rebecca uh, with GBV Consulting and so um, honored to get to be here today. Um, I see a lot of faces and names of folks that we've had the privilege to connect with about this issue. And so it's good to see your names and faces. Also good to see lots of new names and faces and coalitions that um, I recognize but don't necessarily know the person. So it's really an honor to get to share this space with you guys today to talk about a really important issue and an issue that has lots of opportunities for change and growth. And with lots of opportunities, oftentimes come challenges. Um, so Elizabeth was asking this question about how many of y'all had a chance to watch the webinar that Lisa Kaufman did uh, with the consortium on housing. Um, more than anything, just to get a sense, because we were thinking of building off of that webinar, but I think we're really trying to meet folks who are on this call today where y'all are. And so, um, and and just to recognize that there's people on the call today that have extensive HUD experience. They're talking about receiving ESG CD funds. For some of you guys, you may see in the chat ESG CD and you may be like, what is that? Even if you listen to Lisa's webinar, Lisa from the SNAPS office, you still may be like, what is that, right? Like Emergency Solutions Grant, um, you know, CARES Act basically funding. And so, <clears throat> um, uh, so we've got folks on the call who understand the nitty gritty of all of those acronyms. We've got folks on the call who understand that sexual violence survivors who've experienced sexual violence anytime, anywhere, perpetrated by pretty much anyone have housing needs that are not being met, but they may not know all the fancy HUD acronyms or may not be steeped in HUD advocacy. The great thing about that difference in our experience and our expertise is that it brings us to a place where we can better answer lots of people's questions because we got people uh, uh, walking in lots of different shoes towards finding solutions for housing um, for, for survivors of sexual violence. So I'm just kind of reading through the chat here to see um, uh, how many folks uh, got to watch the webinar. Did anybody have any specific questions? I see Mark saying he uh, reviewed the recorded webinar. Um, I'm seeing some folks, um, I think the link is gonna get posted. Some other folks didn't have a chance to check in about the webinar and you know what that's okay like if folks haven't had a chance the the purpose of this conversation is to create a broad enough frame so wherever you are in your lived experience around working with survivors of sexual violence on housing issues that we can connect with your expertise and provide a place for you to kind of plug into this work um, so we're going to try to really create a broad frame and we're really coming at it from the coalition lens right so um, what is what are what's kind of the coalition's role in housing work for survivors of sexual violence? HUD is going to be a part of the conversation today. Um, and uh, what I've heard and talking with a lot of people is when they allow the funder and only the funder to dictate what the needs are and what the solutions are, we end up missing the boat and missing the people who we most need to serve because and so many of us are in a position where we're going after dollars to support our work and then the dollars don't meet the survivors where they are and we find ourselves in a in a position that sometimes can really increase vicarious trauma in programs because you've got all this money and then people keep coming to your door and as as elizabeth was saying it's like oh well you're not hud homeless and so yes you're dealing with sexual violence and yes all you need is actually money to stay in your current housing but this money that we've got right here from hud requires you to flee your housing right and not all hud money necessarily requires you to flee your housing but you see, you begin to see the rub and the vicarious trauma that advocates and coalitions are experiencing as they get money 
feeling like they found a solution to the problem. And then what ends up happening is, uh oh, all the survivors we're serving are actually over here and this money doesn't meet their needs. And so as I block my face while I'm talking, um, we uh, I'm a hand speaker. Uh, so then, so it really, it, it increases, I think, sometimes the trauma around housing work because you've got money, but then it's not meeting people where they are. So I'm just checking the chat again, too. And my co-presenters also wanted to sh uh, shout out to Condensia. Please jump in as we have this conversation. I'm hoping folks, I know we didn't have time to let everybody introduce themselves and where they're coming from. Sometimes that opens up the free flow of conversation. But if you just want to unmute your line, especially as I'm talking, if I use an acronym you're not familiar with, um, if I talk about something that doesn't make sense in your context, just unmute your line or chat in. I want to ask that my, um, my fellow co-presenters help me track that as well um, as we're going through things. Um, Rebecca, uh, yes. if you don't mind, I was going to Go jump it, in Carla. there was Perfect. a question. Uh, yeah. I'm thinking it's Nani, but I may be mispronouncing it. I apologize if I am from Connecticut. Um, they said they were somewhat new to their role, but I think they asked a great question. How would the needs of DV and SV survivors change in terms of housing? And everyone jump in, please. But for me, they don't necessarily, they wouldn't necessarily be different um, in a lot of ways. So they're, more often than more often than in sexual violence situations, a person is fleeing the home that they share with their partner, which would be a domestic violence. If it was a domestic violence situation, they would need to leave that home if they were living together. Um, as Elizabeth shared, there's lots of situations where a person could be fleeing their home where sexual violence is occurring. Um, let's say there's a landlord, a housemate, um, a neighbor. I mean, the list is is endless. Um, but I think that fleeing definition really puts a barrier up because um, I think for a lot of sexual assault survivors and for housing providers and sexual assault advocates, they're not necessarily totally aware of what fleeing means. And we talked a lot about that on the webinar with Lisa um, and she did give some good clarification, but historically, let's just be honest. I mean, this was around domestic violence, and then they included sexual violence, trafficking, and dating violence. So I think there's still sort of a mis miscommunication there. But I think what we also want to say, and this would apply equally to sexual violence survivors, domestic violence survivors, survivors of trauma, um, because we know most survivors are, are survivors of multiple forms of trauma. Housing is not provided based on, on your needs related to trauma. So it's really just about that fleeing situation. And where we're seeing a gap is maybe you're not able to hold, continue with your work or you don't wanna work or you don't feel safe in your home because you were sexually assaulted in your home. Um, and you can still stay, you can still afford to stay there but you don't want to. Um, I remember talking to an advocate in Philadelphia who shared most of the people who have housing issues, their biggest barrier is getting a security deposit to move into another place. Um, so that was a long answer, um, but I think in terms of housing funding, there's a lot of differences between DV and SV, but in terms of sort of um, what survivors need, there's not a whole lot of difference. Um, can I jump Can I jump in though and, and piggyback off that before I turn it back over to you, Rebecca, and just say, housing is housing, right? In some ways we need, like the housing piece of it remains the same. But much as with any other service, sexual violence survivors have distinct needs in terms of the trauma that they've experienced, which are really different sometimes than the needs that someone who has experienced domestic violence might be bringing. And so the, uh, the ability to like both universalize the experience and then also to dig really deep into like, how does this show up differently is important because most of the time when we're talking about housing, we're actually talking about a whole structure of services. We're not just talking about the space, right? That someone is um, living in. We're also talking about supportive services that go potentially along with that if folks want it. And the framing of how that happens needs to look really different um, sometimes when that is, when we're addressing the distinct needs of a sexual violence survivor. Um, so I just wanted to piggyback and say, Yes, and, and then Rebecca, I know you've got more to add to that, my friend. 
Yes. And so today this conversation really isn't again, like Carla was like, hold on, Rebecca, let me put that. If you guys have stuff like that, just jump in. Um, um, today, we really want to, again, come way back and not necessarily get into the nitty gritty details of, of like of HUD funding per se, like how you apply for a NOFA, right? So the NOFA is a no notice of funding availability. This is how HUD lets people know that money for uh, continua of care, which is COC, this is how they let folks know that that money is available, right? So we're going to talk a little bit about that here at the end, but we want to actually have folks back way, way, way up so that before you get to the point where you've received a bunch of money that doesn't, that or you've helped your programs apply for money that may not necessarily meet the needs of survivors, uh, you figure, you first, we're going to talk about kind of the coalition's role in figuring out what those needs are, figuring out where your membership is, figuring out where is the best place to start with housing advocacy, um, um, you know, uh, kind of, and if you're already in housing advocacy, if you're already receiving HUD money, a lot of the things that we've talked about, like, you know, where the definitions and eligibility issues sometimes become a barrier to actually meeting people's needs. Um, what kind of advocacy can you engage in if you as a coalition are already receiving the money or if your member programs are receiving it and running into barriers? What's the coalition's role in addressing that? Um, and I think one of the first things coalitions are thinking about is so, so this kind of policy advocacy work. So this work around how is you know housing and urban development for folks who that may even be a new term, how is this big agency that deals with housing in lots of ways, um, you know, how do we, so it, they don't typically fund coalitions to be involved in just advocacy work or training and technical assistance for their member programs or for the field, right? They're more, they're, depending on what fund, again, this gets really complex, so I'm trying to keep a high level, depending on what funding you're going for under HUD, um, oftentimes it's difficult to just get HUD funding for that type of work unless you have long-term relationships. So for folks who are newer to this work, um, what, um, I'm gonna throw this question to Kat, Elizabeth, Carla, you know, if you're a coalition and you're new to this work or you're already helping your programs, but you're thinking about maybe taking a different strategy around housing work for survivors of sexual violence, what are some ways coalitions can think about funding the work we're about to talk about or funding the strategies to find out what survivors needs are and then to meet those needs through policy and direct housing funding. So I wanna throw that question back to Kat, Elizabeth, Condencia and Carla. Um, how, how might coalitions think about what funding sources could fund that, that coalition work? I am super happy to just start the conversation because one of the things that we know is that, for example, as a coalition, every um, everyone gets OVW coalition dollars, right? And there's a lot actually of um, uh, flexibility about how you choose to use either STOP or SASP coalition dollars in terms of supporting sexual assault in your state and the work that your programs are doing and the needs of survivors. And so certainly if you decided this is a place that you really want to begin to um, shine the light and really focus on building capacity with programs to meet the needs of sexual survivor, sexual assault survivors around housing, if it's something that you want to make sure that there are resources um, right around that would be one place I know that you um, certainly could build that in is to put that right into your um, either SASP or STOP uh, um, funding that you get for coalitions. So I would just start there. I know Carla and Elizabeth and Condensia, VOCA is another place you may be able to build. A, and, and I wanna go back to something you said, Rebecca, relationships, right? It's almost always about relationships and coalitions are relationship builders um, in their, states and territories. And so th the um, part of how you can think about this is who do you know, who do you have a relationship with that is potentially interested in helping fund this work? Is it a priority? Is it a VOCA priority area in your state or territory? Is it a, a state line item priority? Is it something that you may be able to start having conversations with with different funders? So I just want to throw out there again, flexibility, certainly in the OVW funding, 
but also that relational piece, right? Of um, is this a VOCA possibility? Do you want to be talking with your VOCA um, office about that? So. Perfect, Kat. Anyone else want to chime in on that? Because we want, we didn't, what we didn't want to say is, so here's all this work for coalitions and HUD doesn't necessarily always fund this work. Now go forth and do the work. We wanted to recognize a lot of people are on this call because we talked about HUD funding. And so it's like, will HUD fund our advocacy work to make HUD better for sexual violence survivors? Depending on your relationships and what HUD money you're looking for, potentially, but uh, it oftentimes, especially if you don't already have relationships, isn't the place to start. And so wanted folks from NSBRC, uh, RSP, and CSA to uh, uh, kind of address that that elephant in the room per se. Um, so again, coming back to this issue of a broad frame on on meeting the housing needs of sexual violence survivors and figuring out if HUD funding is the way your programs can meet those needs um, or meet certain needs, but recognize that there may be gaps in other needs. So what is kind of the coalition's role in creating these strategies? Um, so uh, I think the first thing to figure out is, yes, Carla. I was just gonna say there's a, another question in the chat that I feel like might be good to address before we jump into that. Um, yeah. How as a coalition do we determine what programs within our state are in need of sexual assault housing resources and begin to support them? Yes, and I saw Ms. Hill's question, and this was actually the perfect segue, um, was, so the first place you, I think, I think sometimes we hear about funding, we hear about a possibility, and we go toward it, right, because we know there's such great need. But if we can take some time to just kind of breathe, which is really hard for me as a survivor to do, everything gets caught up here. Um, if I can take a moment to breathe and connect to the abundance of expertise that our programs and that sexual violence survivors have about their needs before I jump to funding those needs, I feel like that is the place you start. And this gets to the question, right? Is So how do I determine what programs within our state are in need of SA housing resources and begin to support them? So different strategies, different coalitions organize their membership and communicate differently with their membership. You know, I worked at a coalition uh, where we would do a, sur uh, a survey uh, amongst membership. And what we had been hearing for a long time is this is an issue, this is an issue, this is an issue. So we started with a survey. We actually ended up finding a private funder to fund some visioning work around housing. And with the mission of learning from the expertise of survivors, of communities who are oftentimes not considered when policy priorities are set up. Uh, we started by convening these groups of people, building trust, building relationships, leveraging the relationships that coalitions oftentimes already have and asking the questions, what does your housing need look like? Because there's this assumption, Elizabeth, Carla, we're talking about this fleeing thing and Hillary in the, in, in the, in, in the chat talked about this fleeing recent violence that has occurred. And what we're hearing from sexual violence survivors just in my chats and in my work is that yes, for some sexual violence survivors, that's a reality. My landlord is perpetrating, you know, is causing me sexual harm right now. I need to get out. But there are so many people who are adult survivors of child sexual abuse who have who were harassed sexually at work, you know, three years ago and are still having to deal with the same boss and are not able to keep that job, right? And so are going to lose their housing. And how and and oftentimes HUD funding um, is looking at whether you're fleeing or attempting to flee sexual violence. Now, I believe a policy argument can be made that may, even though the sexual violence happened a long time, you're still fleeing the impacts of that violence. Like if you need to move, I've made that policy argument in a COC meeting. It was an interesting meeting. COCs are continuum of care. They handle local HUD money around homelessness. Um, so I think you can make the argument, but it's a tough argument to make and not everybody is on board. And so this takes me back to how do we know what the needs are? Um, I think taking time to convene your membership, to do some focus groups, to look at your coalition funding, look at your SAS funding, look at your VOCA funding, talking with your state, uh, the grant 
a pass through in your state to say, we really need to take to some time. We know there are housing needs here, right? And as Kat was saying, COVID has really unearthed, there's lots of people struggling with this and the way housing is being funded right now is not meeting their needs. But we need to know more so that our local response doesn't create all this money that literally can't get out. Because one of the things I've been hearing about the ESG CV money. So this is the emergency solutions grant money that came down from the CARES Act. This is money that oftentimes funds emergency shelters through HUD. It also it funds what's called homeless prevention. It funds rapid rehousing. Rapid rehousing is a term that HUD uses to talk about medium to short term rental assistance, case management around that. Um, what I've heard about a lot of that funding is they literally can't get it out the door. It's stuck because there aren't landlords who will take the, the, the money. They won't, won't, won't rent to people receiving this money. People don't have the relationships built. People aren't eligible. So literally they have all this money. People are applying and it's like, well, you make a little bit too much or you live in the wrong area or we can't find a landlord who'll pass the housing inspection. So literally the money is stuck. So, I mean, it's a perfect example when you go to local funders, private funders, you know, again, talking to your state pastors to say, we know there's need, but understanding the exact nature of the need in Oregon, as Hillary was talking about, or, or in New York, like, we need to convene survivors, right? We need to convene our members. We need to convene systems partners and find out what they know. Um, and this brings up an interesting, uh, an interesting dynamic uh, that I want to again throw back to my co-presenters, Carla, Cat, Elizabeth, Condensia, is the issue of um, in if you are a standalone sexual assault coalition and you're in a state where there are domestic violence coalitions who've been doing this work around domestic violence, and you're beginning these conversations, Cat, uh, you know, uh, can you guys talk a little bit about? what sex, standalone sexual assault coalitions need to think about as they're navigating those relationships, as well as the politics of, of, of beginning to, to expand the focus of housing work beyond just the needs of domestic violence survivors, but a real both and perspective, which is sexual violence survivors uh, also have needs that we need to be talking about. So I wanted to throw that because that's a reality for standalone sexual assault coalitions. Absolutely. And I think you know, one of the things that makes me think of Rebecca is the, again, bringing it back to relationality, right? Mm -hmm. um, and also centering it in what the needs are within um, communities within your state or territory. So starting by talking, if you have a, if you're a standalone um, SV coalition and you have a DV coalition in your state that's doing housing work, starting with conversations there about like, what's already happening what do you know is happening who's doing it what's um what are the structures and resources that you're aware of and here are some of the things that we've seen would you, you know potentially even partnering with folks to do focus groups right about um what it is that would be useful in housing advocacy within your state and i want to i don't know if we've actually said this so i want to go back to something if i could that i feel like is one of those grounding things rebecca um, which is, I think often when we think about housing, we think we have to have a building, friends. Um, we don't. That's actually the majority of housing money is not about owning a building or managing a building where people have to come and um, and access their housing, right, in, in space that you provide. Rather, there are lots of opportunities for doing as our DV colleagues have been really digging into things like rapid rehousing. There are options for um, scattered site housings. There's the work with landlords that Rebecca was talking about. So I wanted to take a step back because I know for myself, when I originally started this work um, around housing, maybe like eight years ago, 10 years ago now, my initial thought was, uh, well, of course you have to have a shelter or a building or a transitional housing space You own, like that you are administering. And it was, kind of like, you know, mind blowing um, a rearrange of my head to think about the fact that you could provide housing for survivors and never have to manage or own a building. 
because that is not always um, the structure that works potentially for sexual violence survivors. And I say that again, because I feel like this is a great conversation to have with your DV coalition. Like, what's your model? How are you all moving forward? What are you supporting in your state? Um, are you looking really at rapid rehousing and other forms of housing advocacy that um, uh, allow, again, scattered site or other forms of um, uh, housing assistance, right, for survivors? So in my sense, that's one of the best places to start. And then when we started doing work around transitional housing with NNEDV, I would I would say it's a similar kind of thing, right? National SA, national DV organization. And we're, we started to just try to put our heads together to say, what do you already know? And what do we bring, right, to this conversation? And a deep part of what we decided was we needed to do listening sessions and focus groups. We needed to do one on one interviews with folks and ask them really specifically, like what already works um, for sexual violence survivors within the structures that you've come up with and what doesn't? Um, what are the barriers? What are the places uh, right where something different needs to grow or be built? Um, so that, again, I would say is another um, place. and. I imagine there are more, Carla, Elizabeth, um, Nencia, but those those would be the first ones that I would think of as a way to really begin that relationship and think about it. And yeah, I think again, for San Alone Sexual Assault Coalitions, connecting to DV coalitions, finding out what they have and haven't done, what has and hasn't worked, um, and, and building off those relationships, um, um, is, is, I think, again, a thing we wanted to address. The other thing we wanted to address for dual coalitions is that you, many dual coalitions have done a lot of work around this, around domestic violence and their membership, dual programs and standalone domestic violence programs have done a lot of work around this, around domestic violence. So what, what I've seen in our work with transitional housing grantees and lifting up the needs of survivors of domestic violence is there begins to be tension in the room when we start talking about supporting an adult survivor of child sexual abuse who needs assistance with paying rent. And we talk about housing someone who is uh, currently fleeing imminent physical danger. And there begins to be a, uh, a kind of a, a, a prioritization of need. There becomes to be a, how dare you put this person's needs over this person's needs? Don't you understand the danger of the situation? And the reality is not someone's needs are more or less. The reality is really both and, right? Like, because the harm that sexual violence survivors continue to feel to experience, just like the harm intimate partner violence experience years after they may have left the relationship, if there are children involved, if credit has been damaged, if 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 long distance power and control continues to be an issue, the harm continues, right? And someone who is looking at losing their housing, the trauma and stress around that is also harm, right? And so for dual coalitions, I think really also being really cognizant of and really sensitive to where your members are on this issue. Um, um, a lot of times in state budgets, money for emergency how a shelter is some of the biggest money that comes out to victim services programs. So as you're thinking amongst your membership and dual coalitions about what this means to your membership, about how to lead, about how to support the needs of survivors of sexual violence, but also recognize what that means amongst your membership is, is something that you have to I can think be aware of as you begin these conversations. And I don't know if any of my partners have anything they'd like to add to that, or if anybody on the call has anything they'd like to add about those, any conversations they've had with membership around that issue. Rebecca, I just want to um, add along those lines. One of the barriers that we see is that a lot of housing programs, um, the participants are referred from emergency shelter. And so we see that that's another way that survivors of sexual violence um, aren't getting access to housing programs because typically they're they're coming uh, from shelter to transitional housing or to some other type of housing. Yes. So kind of being prepared for those conversations. It's a factor we want to 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 bring to people bring to people's awareness if it wasn't already. 
So um, relationships with your domestic violence coalition, if you're dual coalition, what this means for your membership and navigating those conversations. And if you're wanting to convene conversations with memberships, if you're wanting to think about like, so how do we ask about these questions? What questions do we ask? We don't have time on this webinar to dig into that. And we don't have any resources. I could like send you a checklist tomorrow, but it'd be something that we'd be willing to work with you to help build if that would be helpful for you. Um, and I see Kat saying, but we can help. Um, so this first prong is really stepping back, you know, and cut and breathing and connecting to the abundance of expertise about needs, right? Um, in with survivors, with fellow, the homeless coalition, with the DV coalition, amongst your membership, finding out what you may have members who know a whole bunch about HUD uh, that you don't know about, or a whole bunch about housing needs. You can really tap into that. So once you've figured out kind of where survivors needs are, you may decide that focusing on HUD is the right place to start, right? So in this kind of assessment of, of what uh, survivors housing needs are, you may find that getting access to a specific fund is most helpful. You may find in that conversation that actually you need to back up and do a whole bunch of work with your membership around organizational approaches to serving survivors of sexual violence, organizational change around holistic services, organizational change around requiring people to do things in order to get access to housing. You may have to start your work there before you jump into funding housing. Um, you may have to start work with landlords. You may have to start work with city council dealing with public nuisance issues. And these are where survivors are losing housing because of issues related to their experiences of violence, right? And so you may start in a different place. Um, but if after this assessment, we're jumping over a bunch, you decide that HUD is where you want to start your advocacy. And what I say is wherever you start, HUD is such a huge piece of the pie around housing that you're going to run into HUD eventually. So it's going to come up, but you may not start there. But let's say you eventually get to your HUD kind of policy advocacy uh, piece. The next thing is really, you know, you've learned from your members what they know. It is training your members about HUD. So teaching them about how this system works, like after you've learned, and this is where you can tap into experts in membership to train fellow, um, uh, to train fellow members within the coalition. Um, uh, teaching teaching folks at the local level how to advocate because if you're working on hud you want to be advocating from coalitions can be building relationships with state hud pass-throughs meanwhile coal uh, members are doing work at the local level why is this dual approach helpful if the state is just doing advocacy with the hud funding pass-through so let's talk about ESG. That's come up quite a bit. ESG is a formula grant, right? It's, it's doled out and it's sent to certain jurisdictions based on a formula. You may have a really great rail, uh, relationship with your ESG pass-through and you may be setting some great policy here, but between here and here where ESG is actually distributed, where your local rape crisis center is working on this, you may find a big difference in the policy, right? So they may have set a policy that really helps survivors of sexual violence here, but if your programs can't advocate with the same talking points, with the same policy language, uh, then then you're gonna there's gonna be a um, there's gonna be a gap, right, in in the strategy for this change, and so. Uh, it's training your members on how to work all about HUD, how to work on it. And again, if this is not your expertise, this is, again, something reach out to us. We can talk to you about building these tools, beginning to think about what types of HUD should we talk about first? Because, again, HUD is big. HUD is fair housing. HUD is public housing. HUD is Section 8. HUD is um, community development block grants. HUD is uh, homelessness services. I mean, it's it's big, right? Um, so it's getting your members up to capacity. It's at the same time, you're also wanting to train the HUD players, right? So again, in like who in the HUD system do we need to be talking to? So is it the HUD funding pass through? Is it locally? Again, we've talked about COC, so continuum of care. Like um, in some states, continuum of care is a metro 
group and continuum of care for folks who are new to this, again, is a HUD mandate to coordinate how homeless funding is distributed locally to make it more efficient and to prioritize those with the most need. And I use lots of this because, well, I just use lots of this. Um, uh, and it's, it's a well-intended policy and we know what the road to um, perdition is paved with. Lots of good intentions. Um, so, so uh, at, you need your program, if you're working with your HUD pass through up here, um, you also, and training them, you need, and building relationships with them, you need your local programs to also be training and working with HUD funding. So the reason I mentioned tr with the COCs, excuse me, the reason I mention um, training versus policy work is training sometimes can be a really great way to begin to build relationships, especially cross training. Like we want to learn about your system, especially if you have money for the cross training. We'd like to teach you about our system. You build relationships, you learn. Um, but we know that training without policy accountability uh, moves very little because then everybody has all these best practices, but the eligibility requirements still don't let survivors of sexual violence in, or people are still re being required to be sober to get into housing, or people are still, be yay, kiddos, people are still being required to um, um, access, uh, 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 participate in services to continue to have access to their, to their housing. So um, those are really key aspects is training at the state level, training at the COC or the local level, and then policy work at both level. Um, <clears throat> and then, you know, and so I, I just wanted to check in, are there, and I wanted, before I check in one thing, I saw Mark had a question about funding for vouchers versus funding for capital investments. Did that get c discussed? Uh, Kat, you talked a little bit about owning a building versus, but did that get answered in the chat? I'm sorry, I've not been able to keep up. I'm so glad the chat is robust. No, that makes me I, happy. Okay. I don't think it did. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. And I think Kat had a really great point, right? Like, so you don't, so some programs, so this is the thing. This is a perfect example of understanding survivors' housing needs, right? So you, after you understand survivors' housing needs, you may find you have a bunch of survivors of sexual violence in your community that would really like to live in some sort of congregate intentional community where they share living space where they share duties to what work uh, to to raise children where they find that that would be really healing so you may have this may exist right hypothetically um and you may say you know what we would like to purchase a building and uh build something like that up or someone donates a building okay great if that's based on survivors needs in other and one of the one of the pros of congregate housing that you own and operate is that you don't have to do the advocacy with landlords where you're running into so much discrimination against people because of credit histories, criminal legal involvement, past evictions. It's one of the pros to to advocacy programs running the housing. There are cons to running housing because you become a landlord. Um, you know, it changes the power dynamic with people when all of a sudden you are responsible to the city or to the, go the, the government jurisdiction that you're in. If people are choosing to do things in housing that the city is gonna like put a big eye on, right? So it changes your relationship with people when you own the property in which they live. So it's something you have to navigate around housing needs. So that's an example of housing needs where maybe finding money um, for capital and there so there and there are some HUD grants um, w that are for kind of reinvestment and and, and development work right um, but not but like the most of the most of the homelessness program grants are not for capital investment they are for subsidy yes cat I just wanted to like because as you were talking about that i'm thinking about a lot of things right mm -hmm. and one of them is i i feel like this is a really great conversation for coalitions to have with local programs yes totally like how you know one of the places that again we can invest is in training and making sure that programs in our state or territory have a deep understanding of not just the um what's available right but all of those ways that you can meet those needs that they've identified. And as we're talking about that, I also, I'm like, 
I'm trying really hard to get more spacious. And so yes. I just saw like Kristen, right? In the go, thing go for it. saying planting ideas and she's, um, um, uh, they're thinking about community land trusts and I'm yeah. like, oh my gosh, I love that. And then additionally, somebody else was chatting me and Teresa was like, don't forget, like we have an opportunity right now because of the administration that has just begun, which has a, a deeper investment, right? In the needs of survivors of sexual violence. And so there are probably terrific opportunities yeah. that may be coming up that go way above any given funding source that we're exactly. thinking about right now. Exactly. And so I just wanted to sort of pause us and say, yeah. even as we're thinking about the nitty gritty of this sometimes, to remember we, can think in this like more spacious way about the needs of survivors and then work to figure out how to build it. Exactly. Um, Ex I love so, it. And that's our role as coalitions, I think, is to host the spaces to really deeply hear from programs, from culturally specific programs, from folks in communities of color across the state who you may or may not be connected with, but who probably are the ones that are doing really holistic kinds of housing advocacy to start to like dig into what's happening, what are the needs, and then start to build once you all have developed that as a state, right? Instead of trying to spaciousness, let's not try to squash ourselves into a definition. Let's yeah. build what we believe we need and then figure out how we fund it, right? That's what, and I love it. That's exactly it. So like that congregate idea is an idea, but you've got a million ideas here. And it was an idea to show of like the pros and cons of one idea that had been run with for a long time, but it's one idea and it may not be the right idea locally. And there's so many ideas in the chat that I can't even follow. So, and that as coalitions is like, how do we back up, think broadly, connect to our expertise around needs, and then think abundantly about meeting those needs uh, creatively, innovatively. Um, and that's kind of the role, hopefully, hopefully your coalition um, has space um, um, to, to explore that. Um, because again, if we just go after HUD funding because it's there and we're being invited to apply, does that meet survivor's needs? And only you guys can determine that, right? It may, it may not. Um, so love that, Kat. Um, can I just jump in, Rebecca? Yeah, go um, ahead. Just a couple thoughts we've had as we, we, a um, couple of us, uh, Condensia, Elizabeth, myself, uh, Patima, who is an advocate who does some housing work in California, did a presentation on sexual violence and housing um, that was really needed, was widely attended, and we were asked to come back to do a second session. And I think one of the things we walked away with was, we don't have to do this the way domestic violence has done this historically. Like, I know that's sort of what's being said, but um, that's not what our survivors need. Domestic violence is moving past sort of how that all operates and works in terms of emergency shelter, transitional shelter. Um, I think we just need to be more broad is exactly what you all were saying. Um, and we also had a conversation uh, with a uh, local program in Vermont who does some housing work. And um, one of the things she said, and she was sort of grandfathered into doing that, they received a house um, and they were told a condition of receiving the house was that they had to do housing work as a sexual assault program. Um, and she was just talking about some of the barriers uh, of HUD funding, a lot of audits, things like that. And she said, we want to be able to do what we do well, which is sexual violence advocacy work. And we want to be able to work with our, our housing providers so they can do what they do well. Um, so I just really wanted to stress sort of that relationship building, um, because you may not want a $50,000 grant and, and, and to open a housing structure. You may really want just to be able to access what survivors need in a, in a quick way by having those relationships and having folks who um, are willing to support survivors that you're working with in the, in the array of housing needs that come up. Thanks. Totally agree. I mean, again, like these are the conversations to be having thinking broadly um, you know, are we advocates? Are we landlords? Are we both? And are we something we haven't even considered before because we've got our, our kind of eyes to the ground instead of looking at the sky and looking at one another or, you know, being with one another in whatever ways that we communicate. Um, and, and again, tapping into the abundance and creativity that, um, that is, 
that's within us. And so this is a good point potentially for us to kind of to shift to if you back up again and think spaciously about housing needs and how we might want to meet those needs. Um, and if you decide to do some HUD advocacy, again, really important to be doing this at the state and the local level and really important to be building local programs capacity to be doing this work as you're doing it up here. Other, otherwise, it's like wah, wah, it, it can't you'll all of a sudden start getting lots going to the local level and then they don't have the capacity to respond, right? Um, if, if through those conversations and thinking spaciously, you do have programs that do want to go after HUD funding, um, that do want to apply specifically for the funding that was discussed in the webinar that, um, that was done, uh, that, that Lisa did uh, with, con with consortium. We wanted to talk a little bit about some things you can help your programs think through um, as they analyze whether or not that funding is a good fit for them. Um, so are we cool making the shift now from the kind of broad conversation about it's super important to understand sexual violence survivors needs and creative ways to meet those needs and then deciding if HUD funding fits in there or is a part of a part of that puzzle piece um, instead of just going for HUD funding and then finding out, oh, whoa, like we can't meet the needs of folks. So is it cool now for us to kind of shift to, if you have found that a piece of this puzzle is going after HUD funding, kind of coalitions roles in helping their member programs think through that funding. Um, and is there anything else in the chat I've missed or that we want to lift up before we make that shift? And there's so much, I'm so glad to see the chat is like, that's so awesome. <laughs> we have just been having all kinds of conversations in that's the chat. Right. Yay. Um, yes, and I know that, uh, um, you know, lots of ideas about different ways that housing can, housing needs can be met, uh, who, we, who folks can partner with, what, you know, some of the pieces, again, around capital investments, land trusts, around using hotels, right, for sexual assault housing, about asking crime victim compensation programs to um, provide um, rent relief. Um, uh, I love this, um, supporting tenants organizing, right? Like, yeah. how do we, how do we help, yeah, build relationships between local agencies and tenants unions? Um, all of that is what's playing out in the chat um, and more because it is robust. Today. That makes me so happy. <laughs> yep, yep. And I think that we probably can just maybe take a minute and just pause and say, any is there anything yes. else that folks really want to get a chance to sort of lift up, talk about, dig into before we move to that piece around local programs and, and when HUD might be a fit? Or anything bigger before we get a little more micro we're at the macro for sure i imagine mark that probably that's definitely possible um uh to right to send out the chat carla and jen yeah it'll it should be in the recording and we'll try to pull out awesome the, you know yeah the yep um other things anything big picture before And this is so exciting because like, especially big picture, because there's so much of housing work that I was talking, I was sending some stuff to Kat and Elizabeth around broad housing policy. And one of the, and I've been doing some work around thinking about what is housing, like what defines housing, right? And what is housing advocacy? And one of the things I was thinking long and hard about is every, all programs are pushing people to continue to rent. What about, you know, so we're talking about land trust, right? About like, why, why aren't we supporting people who would like to, think about ownership, like, why aren't we thinking that, right? Like, we're okay with sending rent to folks who already own housing, right? Oftentimes big, big kind of corporate entities that snapped up a lot of housing during the crisis, you know, at, at the turn of like 2009, 10. But when it comes to helping people, you know, um, get assets or accumulate wealth around housing, all of a sudden that is forbidden and not doable, right? So like thinking again about those big ideas, like why won't, why don't we go there? So it's exciting, again, these conversations. And I'm just looking at the chat.
So I guess one of the questions is in the in the webinar, we had said we would talk specifically about some of the details of HUD funding and the coalition's role in helping member programs think about that, especially folks who are newer to it. Is that something folks want to shift to and talk about right now? I could just read the chat because it's that exciting, <laughs> like which Kat already did. She did a great. Um, is that helpful to kind of help people think about, uh, I think, some questions that you as coalitions, if someone comes to you and says, I see this HUD funding here, because um, I've heard of some people who went after the ESG CV funding because it was money. And then they were like, and then they started hearing about, as, as Carla was saying, the, the, the audits and the reporting and the reports and all of the meetings that they had to attend. And they were like, oh, Lord, what have we gotten ourselves into? Um, and so... Uh, I see uh, Rosa saying, I worked in banking. There's a lot of red tape to eliminate solutions ensuring that survivors don't sign into land. Yes, exactly. Like there's the buy to, you know, rent to own. And so this whole housing advocacy piece, like helping people understand um, what their rights are, um, what their needs are and helping them, you know, advocate for that. Um, so are folks cool with kind of a shift on just some things to, as coalitions to think about, uh, to think about if your programs are interested in going after HUD funding. And again, I, I meant to say this at the beginning, I think there's a lot of people listening to this call right now could be facilitating this conversation. And so it's an honor to get to kind of hold space and be a talking head. And I'm so glad that this space lets people uh, chat, do such great chat and connecting in the chat. It's awesome. Okay, so we've got 15 minutes left. So to honor the kind of commitment we made to folks to touch about on this a little bit, we're gonna go ahead and, and shift to um, um, what some key things you might, some key questions you wanna ask programs um, about you know, whether or not HUD funding meets their needs. So the first real question is, does the HUD funding program, and specifically I'm talking about the funding that was discussed in the webinar that we've referenced from Lisa Kaufman. So does COC funding, ESG funding, and then there's some runaway and homeless youth um, demonstration grant projects, which we're not going to delve into because it's a real, it's a small piece of the pie, important work, but also a real small piece of the pie. So one of the big questions is, do the eligibility requirements for this program, does being, because many of these programs require that you be homeless or about to be homeless with a very limited definition of what homeless means does that meet sexual violence survivors' needs? So if you are working with a lot of people who need rental assistance to stay where they are because of long-term impacts of sexual violence, the HUD, most HUD funding, you're going to get real frustrated with trying to thread that needle um, because it's really hard for those folks to be eligible. Um, even if HUD were to come down with a policy memorandum, sorry to get into the weeds, that says these people were eligible to convince the local COC, the folks who coordinate that funding, um, to convince them that those people are a high priority on an eligibility list is a big, big policy and political lift for coalitions as well as local programs, right? So that is one big question you want to help your members figure out. What are the housing needs of survivors? Like, so are these people coming from shelter or from the streets um, or who are actively fleeing recent violence? In those cases, HUD funding may be a better fit for you. But if you've got folks who are really wanting to stay where they are and just get housing and get funding to stay where they are, that may not be the best fit, right? So that's one question is eligible, you know, are the folks you want to serve eligible? Um, local COCs, I can't emphasize this enough, have lots of power in interpreting HUD policy. They are the ones who decide who gets funded in the continuum of care uh, funding round. Um, they are the ones who decide who gets prioritized. So when there is a list of people who need access to HUD homelessness funded programming, the assessments that COCs choose and the prioritizations um, uh, scales, let's say, that the that the COC use, um, I'm trying not to get too in the weeds, I'm fighting it, like, uh, those determine whether or not the, so, so let's say you have a lot of survivors of sexual violence who are who are in shelter right now, right? Who need, it feels like eligibility is a good fit. The next question is, 
What is your relationship with your COC? And can you influence COC policy so that those people are a priority in how the COC has set up something that's called coordinated entry? And I've seen a lot of you reference CE in the chat. CE is coordinated entry. This is another HUD uh, mandate that basically says everybody who receives homelessness funding locally needs to coordinate how people get access to that funding and then who what funding you know within all the different programs what program they're referred to and what they get access to within all of those so your relation so th this is the next question right so if you go if you decide to go after hud funding what is your program's relationship with the local coc because the local COC, beyond just setting the policy for who is eligible and how people get access, they also decide who gets funded in COC funding rounds. And the COC funding I heard Lisa say last time was $1 billion, right? So it's it can be a big chunk of housing money coming into your community. Um, but the very people you may have to be advocating with to open up space for sexual violence survivors are oftentimes similar or same people. And I'm using this kind of poking motion, but they're the same people who are going to decide if your program, if the local program gets funded, right? So sometimes that can also create a rub. We're trying to push for policy advocacy that's better for sexual violence survivors. People are kind of frustrated by it. So maybe they don't decide to fund us in the next funding round because the COC decides, sets up a whole policy and protocol for those applications. So that is another key piece is what is the relationship with your local programs with the COCs? Can they influence policy? Um, so that's another piece. Another piece that your programs want to think about is reporting requirements and confidentiality. So do they have the capacity as a program to gather all the information that HUD requires to maintain it in a comparable database because victim service providers can't put uh, victim sur uh, survivors uh, personally identifying information into the database called homeless management information systems. This is the database HUD uses to track whether or not homeless, and I'm using quotes again, homeless services are effective. Um, victim service providers can't use those databases. So does your program have the capacity to with you know maybe a ten thousand dollar grant for a housing assistance to do lots of data collecting lots of data entry lots of reporting and to also deal with the perennial battle around confidentiality like we cannot share this information with you like what so did your, do your programs have capacity around that? And some programs really may and really feel like it's their work to influence that system around those issues. Great. Other programs may be like, no, we don't have the capacity. Um, um, so those are some really key points, right? Working with your COC, helping programs think about that. We're about to wrap up. Reporting requirements, databases, confidentiality. Do programs understand that? Do they feel like that's their mission? Do they want to take that on? Do they have the capacity? And then what are local relationships with at the COC in terms of policy, as well as in terms of getting funding? So those are some critical questions on top of the eligibility question that coalitions can help members think about as they're figuring out whether or not to pursue HUD funding. And now I'm gonna turn it back over to our uh, co-presenters. Okay. Thank you so much, Rebecca and everyone. Um, and thank you all for being so interactive throughout this whole presentation or conversation, let's be honest. Um, I wanna give um, an opportunity for folks to ask any last minute questions. Nice. We need to share that she's experienced some workarounds to protect confidentiality in other states. Uh, there is a link for the solicitation um, up here. Um, so there's a open sign up for HUD emails, in, a link for that. And then there's info around the uh, FY21 NOFA. Yes. 
And the FY21 NOFA, just a quick, like, since there was a direct question about that, mm -hmm. has not been released yet, right? So uh, you've got the link to the page to monitor that. You can sign up for HUD emails where you'll find that out. Actually, last week, HUD just announced who was awarded COC funding for the FY20 NOFA. So, um, so just a heads up. Mm. Yeah, Mark, um, that is something we could do uh, in the consortium, just because uh, a lot of those folks are much more connected with the NOFA. They can get a better, like a rough idea of when that would be. Um, the one thing I do want to share in terms of the NOFA is that it really does require a lot of networking if this is new for you. So if you as a coalition are going to work with certain programs, you're going to have to have all in your proposal, you're going to have to have all that worked out with the programs that you plan to work with. Um, so it's it's quite a big undertaking. So if, if you're a standalone coalition, I highly recommend connecting with your DV coalition. And if you're not, if you're a dual program um, and thinking about including sexual assault, uh, in that housing work, that would be a little bit of a an add-on. But I, I think as we move through connecting with different states, we'll have more information about how different states do it. Um, but it is, I think that's the one thing I can walk away <laughs> with. Uh, housing is complicated, but the one thing I've definitely learned is that every state is different, every community is different. And so really spending the time to sort of figure out what the landscape is, is super helpful. Um, because you could be you as a coalition or your programs could be the subgrantee, where you'd still have to do a lot of the work, but it wouldn't be as heavy of a lift initially. Um, so yes. And I would add just one more, like again, super basic framing piece, which is something we sometimes don't say, this is our work friends. Um, like sometimes I feel like we think this is DV work or we think it's work that somebody else is doing or, but this really is deeply our work um, to make sure that sexual assault survivors have safe housing, have um, access to what they need to heal. And so I just want to bring that back to um, remind us all and really center us in the fact that lots of people are doing it and it still is our work too. And then if I, if I can just add, Kat, I think this is also one of those areas where I feel like you know, sometimes when we think about the culture, civic, community, color organizations, we think of them as, um, you know, they need assistance, but this is one of those areas where they may actually have more um, experience with this in terms of trying to work through housing and navigate housing for their community and uh, a true partnership and collaboration with the community of color organization can lend your expertise as a coalition in you know statewide and territorial strategy um, with what they've been look, doing in their local level to really you know have a, a strong partnership to address um, housing overall so you know as, as you're thinking about partnering with folks you know again you know if you're, if you're trying to figure out and I know, as, as Kat said, you know, or Carla said, you know, look at your DV coalition, you know, touch base with your community color organizations as well and see, you know, some of them may already be engaged um, with, you know, however minimal it is. Some of them may be, you know, engaged with doing this work and you can learn some strategies from them as well. So I just want to lift that up because I feel like, you know, sometimes when we think about these issues, it, it feels somewhat new to the broader SA group. But for communities of color organizations, they've been they've been addressing these issues and really looking at issues of housing and you know insecurities around that for a very long time. So just want to kind of lift that up. Yes, thank you so much for that, Condensia. Um, that's been another huge sort of focus for us um, is that we have we have models of what's working with sexual assault programs, um, culturally specific sexual assault programs, um, and so we need to continue to lift that up. Um, okay, we have one minute. Um, I just wanted to share quickly um, that we will share the chat. We will share all the resources mentioned in the chat. Um, and it feels like we may want to do a follow-up conversation, maybe schedule an hour for another time to, to talk more because this was awesome. Um, it really, really was. Um, I want to thank everybody who was on. Uh, thank you for your patience with our some of our technical uh, messiness, um, but yeah, thank, thank you all so much for, for taking the time to be here. And um, you all know folks on this call, so please reach out if you need anything at all from us. Um, 
We are here available, excited to talk about it, as you can probably tell. Um, and we also will also be recording this. It's in English and in Spanish, so we will have that posted. Um, but yeah, keep in touch, look out for more, and thank you, thank you so much for being here today.